Hi, everybody. Hi, Jesse. Hi. I thought that I was fully prepared to start this meeting from my new laptop, and I'm not. So, <laughs> yeah. I like your new glasses. Hey, thanks. I don't like wearing them, but sometimes I have to. I'm going to just uh, turn off my video because I'm going to go back and forth between that computer, hoping that I can get it up because uh, we have a couple minutes until we're going to officially start. Hi, everybody. As you come in, don't mind me. I will be, I'm right here. I'm right here. Okay. So now I don't know how to leave the other one. Got some really funky reverb going on there. Uh, hopefully that fixed the problem. Yeah, all right. Just call me a tech wizard here. <laughs> okay. I am going to share my screen. All right, and then, hi everybody, welcome as you're um, entering. I am trying to no, it's not what I want. I'm trying to set this up so that we'll be able to hear everything well. Uh, There's just a weird delay up here for me getting my, my uh, I'm so happy that I've figured out how to edit for our YouTube videos. So all of this fun stuff isn't on there for anybody who's gotten to review them. Okay. Uh, Hopefully that works. When we get to the point where we are playing a few videos, let me know if you can't hear well, and I will see what I can do about it. I think right now I have it set to optimize that. Let's see if I can see more lovely faces. Welcome anyone who has never been with us before. Welcome old friends. Very happy to see you. Um, this is our October 2022 meeting of the Southeastern PA chapter of Wild Ones. I just had my screen go blank. I'm Jesse. I'm the president, uh, but 
we are having our nominations this month. So if anybody wants to usurp me, you have to get your nomination in tonight. Uh, let's see if we can do this. Our next screen will tell you who all of our chapter officers are. That's me at the top. That's how you reach me. I apologize if it ever takes me a bit of time to answer your emails. I am a very busy lady, but I will get to them as soon as I can. So hang in there, bear with me, and I appreciate your patience. Audrey is our vice president. She's done an amazing job supporting us, providing lots of passion and interest and information. She is a really great researcher and comes up with great ideas for our thoughts of the month, our tree of the month, and just things that we need to address as a chapter. Susan is here with us. She is our secretary and our webmaster. Her email is there. She's probably better at answering emails than I am, but we all do the best we can. She is also the most amazing newsletter creator uh, we're so fortunate to have her, and I know that lots of people and lots of other like-minded organizations also share our email, I mean, our newsletter, because it is so great. So thank you, Susan, for everything you do for us. Denise is our treasurer. We're so happy to have her looking after our finances, making sure our ducks in a row. Um, there's a lot of paperwork stuff that happens at the end of the year that uh, Denise is already thinking about, thank goodness. Lindy's our membership chair. Marilyn, we're always so happy to have her and her support and her information and knowledge about native plants. Um, we had had a homeowner advisor committee chair, but we haven't really been able to do anything with that committee. And um, so that may be future possibilities for you um, or for someone you can wrangle into the position and a community projects committee chair we could also use for sure. All of the ways you can follow us, find information about us. We list lots of our resources on our website, which I believe looks different now. So that picture may not be accurate. We're um, on Facebook. Our social media presence is not super strong, but we put some things on there sometimes. So we like to share other people's things also. Um, our YouTube channel is where you go if you've missed a meeting. All of the meetings are on there. Um, and like I said, they're, they are edited. So some of the technical difficulties disappear, unlike real time. Instagram happens sometimes. Uh, but if you are interested in any of those platforms and really want to increase our presence on them, volunteer to do that for us. And we can get even more word out there about our chapter and about native plants in general. I'm gonna scroll down here because we have an exciting, hmm, we have um, an exciting presentation tonight, but I bet that's Ben, we've never actually met. So I'm guessing because he's got a fancy setup that that might be who I'm looking for. Awesome. Um, I also just realized that I was reading the notes from last month's meeting. So I'm glad I didn't like start my spiel about the presenter because it would have been all wrong. So let me just bring up tonight. I did want to let you know, we have 146 members in our chapter. As of today, we got five new members from the last month, um, Phoenixville, Philadelphia, Havertown, Lansdowne, and Warminster are all areas um, that we have at least one member in. I like to share this information for you guys out there so you can see you have a strong wild ones presence in your town. See if you can reach out to them. Uh, we can help you connect with people in your towns and maybe you can do something even outside of your property to other properties and really make a big impact. Now, this is what I was getting to. Okay, tonight we have Ben. Now, Ben, I hope that I didn't misspeak because I have you as Kessler, but that the um, name that comes up is not that. 
So you will let us know if that's not accurate, but I'm hoping this information is accurate. Little Blue Stem, where Ben comes from, cultivates a resilience a resilient and harmonious future for central Virginia's land and people, human and otherwise, through collaborative projects, community education, and local genotype native plant propagation. Their nursery seeds, tends, and distributes native plants that are essential to the resilience of our bioregional ecosystems. Community partnerships and educational programs like tonight, focused on ecology and land-based skills, facilitate the exchange of information, labor, and nourishment between ourselves, our neighbors, and the non-human inhabitants of the landscape for the mutual benefit of present and future generations. How was that, Ben? Yeah, that sounds about right. That's, uh, yeah. that's that is I totally stole it what, from we're, the website. what we're trying to do. <laughs> that's awesome. awesome. Yeah, no, I'm here. I'm here. There's there's actually two Bens here in the room. There's me, Ben Kessler, and my good friend and podcast co-host and podcast engineer, Ben Patterson here. Hey. Perfect. That's your the, name I'm seeing. Run the boards okay. for me. Double Bens. I love it. There we go. Okay, so I am going to mute so that you can take it away and talk to our fine folks about everything you want to talk about tonight. Very good. And just so that I, I don't step on toes or go over long, I've got, what, about half an hour, an hour? How long am I doing this? Uh, we can go all night. We are um, up for it. But <laughs> no, whatever you are ready for, we will take it. Oh, man. Be, be careful what you wish for. Um, <laughs> Cool. That sounds great. Um, so off the bat, I don't know if there's a chat window uh, that's available here. So if folks have anything they're particularly interested in in hearing about, any questions they want answered or subjects they want covered, um, throw them up early and I'll see if I can interact, uh, uh, interject them or interpolate them, interpolate them, that's a word, into well, the, the bulk of the thing. Great. How about if... Um... Audrey, would you be able to keep an eye on that chat box and interject as needed, or we can kind of pause and catch up with a few questions as we go? Yeah, I, actually, I was just writing that in the chat, Jesse. Huh? I will keep an eye on it. Perfect. All right, cool. We'll we'll do that. I'll just break as break as we're making points and hear some voices from the peanut gallery and keep on going. Um, okay, so what I've got on the on the books today to talk about is um genotype dynamics and species dynamics and kind of what happens to species over time in a place and sort of lay that as a ground layer for talking potentially in the future audrey mentioned y'all had an interest in doing something with um, integrating native and non-native species into garden plantings landscape plantings orchard plantings etc but i think to, to really dive into that and give it its its day, it's helpful to have some of this groundwork laid in advance. So that's the uh, that's the one context. So I guess I can start by padding a little bit about Little Blue Stem, who we are and what we do. Thanks so much for for reading our our kind of expanded mission statement. Um, we are a um, democratically organized group of people um, who are doing this work. The nursery is a component of what we do. The educational um, events like this are part of what we do. We also do kind of community organizing and activism um, for the benefit of, of non-human persons, which is also part of what we do. Kind of our core underlying philosophy has it that there are no things in the world, only people. Um, all organisms have, in our view, the, the rights of self-determination and self-worth. And so that's the attitude that we approach study of what's going on in a landscape with. So while a lot of us do come from academic scientific backgrounds, we tend to break with an overly reductionist attitude when it comes to dealing with the, the individuals involved. And so, you know, we incorporate philosophical bases from far more than just the kind of the western western book learning into our work so that'll probably come up as we go on so that's the basis of it um 
And so Ben and I here in the studio in fabulous Grayface Studios, a award-winning world-class <laughs> Ben's attic. It's an attic full of Ben's. <laughs> um, we do a podcast here uh, that releases monthly, every couple of weekly, um, that is all about stuff generally related to botany and ecology and place-based stuff. We just dropped one um, where we interview an, an ecosomatic therapist who kind of uses nature, nature work as a component of their therapeutic practice. We've interviewed community organizers and botanists and poets and each other. Um, and so I will probably reference a couple of episodes we did on this subject of genotype and species dynamics because we also get into the weeds of the science. So if you're interested in a far more expanded version of this kind of thing, um, you can listen to some episodes of our show and, and get the big picture version if you're not totally sick of it by the time I'm done talking tonight. Um, okay, so are there any questions to start out that uh, could help frame this thing? Rights of nature. Nope, I haven't seen it. I guess it's good. Is that that's about the um, the uh, the personhood uh, thing in um, New Zealand, uh, right? With the river. Oh no, it's in Pennsylvania, and also. Oh. It's a small town in Pennsylvania who um, found out a farm was going to be used for fracking waste. Mm -hmm. and they have a Native American community that lives nearby, and um, they all got educated, and uh, they sued the uh, util the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection on behalf of nature because nature has rights. So you should, I think you would love it. Dope. That's awesome. Yeah. No. There's a there's a lot of cases where folks are are utilizing um, natural rights or the rights of, of parts of the landscape for um, legal or municipal gain. Um, yeah, definitely something to look out for in the world and then angle of this with some public policy implications. So we're going to go from the macro of that to very, very micro. Um, so talk about local genotypes. So we are a local genotype nursery. So what the heck does that mean? Why does it matter? Uh, why not native plants, a native plant or a plant's a plant, or they're just green furniture. We all know that that's not true. Um, so genotype to oversimplify it dramatically is the sort of genetic lineage of a organism. That's it's little lowercase f family, uh, its ancestors, who they come from, where they're going, plants, it's usually not very far because they're rooted to the ground. Um, and phenotype, which is the physical expression of an organism. Um, phenotype usually has something to do with the genotype, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. And this is a dramatic oversimplification because you've got things like exogenetics, epigenetics, and all kinds of complications on that that make the kind of Punnett Square sixth grade science class version of this not as applicable in reality as uh, we all learned about it the first time, but don't worry about that. Genotype means family, roughly. So when we're talking about local genotype, we're talking about the family of plants, the lineage of plants, the lineage of the, the organisms the, whose ancestors lived in whatever place you happen to be talking about. If it's that whatever river valley you live in in Pennsylvania, those plants that are endemic to that region or have a local genotype are from that place. And there can be a great deal of variation of genotypic and phenotypic expression of plants from one little valley to another little valley. As to why that matters or is significant um, beyond, you know, the intrinsic worth of a family to itself and to anybody who cares about them, um, listen on. Okay. So I guess I can only see like five of you, so I shouldn't ask you to raise your hands if you've heard of a species before or whatever. I mean, you all have. You know what a species is. Um, <laughs> species is any 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 type of organism that can can mate with itself and produce a viable offspring. So horses are a species. Donkeys are a species. You put a horse and a donkey together, and if they like each other well enough, they have a baby. But the baby doesn't have more babies. That baby's a mule or a hinny, 
and mules don't make mules, hennies don't make hennies, so that makes horses a species and donkeys a species, but not mules. Okay, yep, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Um, species, as we think about it in those terms, works fine for animals, for zoology, plants, and fungi, uh, and bacteria, and quite a few protists, and actually really anything, most living organisms other than animals, don't really fit into those kind of neat categories. Um, so plants uh, often form stable hybrids or intergrades or whatever you want to subspecies, sometimes you call them, that are the fertile offspring of multiple organisms that we'll call species. So a good example around here, and I think they extend up into y'all's neck of the woods in Pennsylvania, are the wild rise the gen genus uh, Elimus or Elimus. So around here, we've got uh, Elimus hystrix, that's the bottle brush grass, and Canadensis, the Canada wild rye, uh, Glabrofloris. Um, what is Glabrofloris' common name? It's some dude's name. Mag 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 Magregoria, yeah, yeah, that's another one. McGregor's, Gregor McGregor's yeah, yeah, that's from right. Poyer. Um, Anyway, uh, there's a bunch of them, riparius, the riparian wild rye. So you'll often find in a stand of these things, um, on one end of the stand in its their, their typical habitat, so like riparian wild rye, which grows on, on riverbanks, right on the bank of the river, you'll see a bunch of wild rye that looks pretty definitely like riparian wild rye, Elemis riparius. And then uphill, where it's a little drier, where you're in the floodplain, but it's not inundated all the time, you'll see something that looks a lot like... Uh, Elemis hystrix, the bottle brush grass. And in between the two, you'll find some plants that have the tight florets of the wild of the riparian wild rye, and some that have the sparse florets of the Elemis hystrix, and all manner of weird mutant babies in between the two. And we call those intergrades. Are they their own species? No, their genetics are all over the place. Is riparian wild rye its own species? Well, is riparian wild rye and bottle brush grass the same species, but just different epigenetic expressions of them, different phenotypic expressions of them, I should say, based on habitat? Uh, nobody's really looked into it. So until we actually run the genetics on all this stuff, um, what we're dealing with is lots of different organisms will mate with each other and form stable populations that sort of defy our traditional taxonomic classifications. So why it doesn't pay to be too doctrinaire about what particular species exists in an area and where locality of origin is actually more significant than the species designation even uh, when it comes to the idea of the thing. So um, this really comes into play when you have hybridization between native and non-native strains or even native and non-native species present in a place. So um, there's native and non-native strains of wild yarrow, boreal yarrow in the area. There's native and non-native strains, strains of um, heal all or self heal that we find in the area to such an extent that it kind of stops meaning anything to say this is a native species or this is a non-native species when talking about yarrow or prunella in the area um, to the point there, you know, being doctrinaire about being exclusively native or exclusively, um, you know, trying to eradicate all non-natives. Well, so what, you're going to rip all the yarrow out of the meadow? That yarrow is, the genes are intermingled. You're talking about the same organism as being both simultaneously native and non-native anyway. Um, endless are the arguments of taxonomists. Um, what's really significant for the home gardener is kind of the distinction between regional genotype or local genotype, general straight species natives, or cultivar natives, or nativars as they're sometimes called. And so a little blue stem um, stance is more or less as follows. So local genotype natives are great. That's what we grow. That's what we encourage everybody to grow. Go out in the woods, find seed, uh, harvest no more than 10% 10 per 10 of the seed in a stand, propagate it yourself, share it among your neighbors, grow it out. That's your local genotype probably, even if it's 
part of its parentage comes from somebody's yard escapee. The fact that it's growing in the wild and surviving indicates that probably there's some parentage of it that's from around there at some point in the past. Grow that stuff. That's good for the land. It's from there. It's used to the conditions there. Um, all right, say there you're in a subdivision that's been, you know, totally wrecked down to the subsoil as everything's been scraped up and churned up into a, a maze of of impermeable surface roadways and Ryan Holmes construction and, you know, all sorts of stuff that's got a shelf life like discount yogurt in the geological or even the ecological or even the historical framework. Those houses really just don't stand up very much. So if you've got something like that, an environment like that, that's on the move really, but it's basically scraped up everything that's not in the subsurface seed bank, uh, you might as well plant what you can get. So yeah, whatever, buy some seeds from Ernst. Um, which actually for you guys is relatively local for us, not so much. Um, slow it down, you know, better something than nothing. Um, but what we strongly advise against is planting so-called native ours, the cultivar natives. And so these are native plants bred by people who don't like what native plants look like. Uh, they want things that have big grotesque blooms and, you know, weird smells and strange foliage uh, and, and all sorts of mutations. Did everybody else lose Ben too? Yes, can hear. Yes. I thought that it was just me. Ben is frozen in time and space and hopefully he will snap back on. Unless he also doesn't know that he's frozen. Good call. Audrey letting him know in the chat if he's keeping an eye on that or if maybe he lost everything. Oh, we lost him. <laughs> now he's floating in space. He will be back, I'm sure. Maybe. My internet connection is unstable as well. I don't know what's going on. It is raining cats and dogs where I'm at. I don't know if you are getting that weather also, but maybe that has something to do with it. We got it overnight. Um, okay, let me see. Oh, he, A, Ben is back, probably both. Ben, your video and mic are off, but I see your name square. All right, there we're back are. again. Sorry Woo! about that. No problem. <laughs> hey, technical. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Technical has fixed us back up. Love it. Um, all right. I think Everyone I was. Needs uh, a ben. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've, we've got a spare. <laughs> Send him up. <laughs> oh, man. In high demand here. One of us is. I think it's you. Um, we want you at Native Arts are bad. All right. Cool. I mean, that's really all I was going to say. Um, <laughs> you got the gist of it. <laughs> Yeah, the gist of it. Yeah, so you know they're they're bred to they're bred to move plants. They're bred to sell things for nurseries. There's a certain amount that um, you know in the nursery the nursery business has very very narrow margins. Um, so basically anything to you know I have a lot of sympathy for folks doing big commercial nursery. Well, for doing mids for doing spot, I have sympathy for some people in the nursery business. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> you. Uh, you gotta you gotta develop new new product to keep things fresh at a certain scale. Um, so nursery industry is very much a a stair step. This is off the side, but what the heck? Um, it's kind of a, a stair step profit model. So there are sort of tiers at which production. You're not going to gain any new profit based on your infrastructure investment, based on your staffing investment, based on your product line investment until you hit basically a certain line of, of gross production. Um, so more so than some industries, which are more kind of go up on a, on a steady grade. So for nurseries in between say 10 grand and a million in gross sales, which is, you know, a pretty big step up between, you know, very small scale and maybe a mid scale uh, regional nursery. You know, you really got to leverage as much as you can. Otherwise, you're just going to be hemorrhaging dough. And so, I can understand nursery commercial nurseries wanting to release 
new product line. That's a way of generating jump sales for a season by say releasing a new native R species. So you can sell that to, you know, the gonks who want native natives are good, right? I'll plant natives, but this one's pretty. It looks like lavender and it's a milkweed. I'll plant that for $14 a, a quart. Sure. Um, and then next season they'll, they, you know, they'll buy something else because they've already got that. And anyway, it, it died because it didn't grow very well. Um, so I can understand people wanting to rush these things out. However, ca capitalism is a, is a poor excuse for doing ecology. Um, don't base your ecology based on what sells. Um, yeah. Uh, the problem with that is the same gene that makes it look lavender and pretty might also restrict its release of um, certain polysaccharides into the soil that allow that milkweed to participate and collaborate and develop a meaningful, negotiated, healthy relationship with the fungi and bacteria and soil protists that it's going to rely on to get it through a drought, right? So the plant might look good for a while, and then as soon as hard weather hits, it's going to tank. So all that time that it's sitting there looking pretty, it's also pollinating out to all of the endemic indigenous milkweeds that are present somewhere at the edge of the pollination zone and spreading the gene which governs pretty lavender flowers or maybe just crappy deficient roots out to them all. And you're not going to see the effect on that immediately. This is kind of a lasting form of, of genetic pollution, if you will, that can be very dangerous uh, in practice as it reduces the capacity of your regional plant population to withstand adverse conditions. So you're probably not going to see it immediately. You're probably not going to see it in a good year, but in a bad year and during a regime of climatic chaos, bad years come, they could be too wet, they could be too dry, they could be too hot, they could be too cold. We don't know. And it's irregular. The plants don't know either. So you could be spreading adaptive traits, but more than likely you're spreading pretty but maladaptive traits. So that's the danger of native ours and why it's better to just plant a completely non-native species because you plant one or two you know uh you know bush bamboos or something like that there's probably not going to be enough bush bamboo within its pollination range for it to establish a stable population yeah it might propagate vegetatively for 100 years but then it's going to die and then it's not going to be there anymore as opposed to introducing um, viable but deleterious genetic traits into a long-running endemic species population. So that's the that's the main punchline of why you want to go local genotype. And so to a lesser extent, this is also why, if possible, you want to be planting local genotype stuff as opposed to non-local genotype stuff, because a plant that evolved in Nebraska is going to be used to very different conditions and going to have very different um, symbiote partners and the various exudates and hormonal controls and so on that relate to its, its cos in the landscape than a plant that's endemic to whatever part of Pennsylvania y'all are at. Yeah. Why planting plants from, you know, your, your watershed is maybe even more sensible than planting stuff within your artificial political boundary that we're calling a state why calling something a Pennsylvania native is basically meaningless, whereas saying this is a Susquehanna River watershed native, that actually means something, right? Um, they're all approximations, but you can get to, you can use more, more or less accurate or precise measures to determine the approximations you're using when declaring your um, categories. So, This is kind of doing it backwards, but one of our preoccupations at Little Blue Stem is with minimum viable population dynamics and minimum viable metapopulation dynamics, which is a lot of a lot of word salad, I realize. But let me try to break it down because it is one of the more promising modes for folks interested in growing plants and working with plants to beneficially affect the landscape for millions of years down the line which if we're talking about ecology is the scale that we're talking about. So this is the minimum viable population is kind of the basic unit of extinction. So we're all in a mass extinction event right now. So that's all very scary in the abstract, but let's try to break it down to what does that, what does that mean 
pattern wise in the day to day. So the minimum viable population is basically what it says on the can. It is the smallest population group of organisms of a given species, which when we're talking about plants, remember, doesn't, doesn't mean what we think it means, that can persist given conditions that are likely to happen. And likely to happen right now includes a tremendous range of extremes. So the viability for most species is going to require a much bigger base population in order to accommodate the many, many, many minor and major disasters that might befall a given group of organisms in a place at a time looking forward. To disambiguate, disambiguate that a little bit um, by making it smaller. That means, say, drought tolerance uh, as a threshold. Oh no, not again. <laughs> so I'm sure everybody else is figuring it out, but I think Ben might be a genius. <laughs> uh, um, I was surprised that I've never, uh, maybe I shouldn't say never, but I've rarely heard the argument to plant something completely non-native so that it doesn't dilute the gene pool versus, you know, at least the cultivar. So that is fascinating and really has my gears moving. Um, yeah, this is going to be a great conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's fascinating to hear someone in the trade so um, intelligent and driven obviously by this overarching non-human centric view and I just love it. Yeah he was wonderful 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 to work with when we did our garden in, in the Charlottesville area. Just a wealth of information but and just back. a really nice guy you know. Just we have to stop talking guy. about him now because he's back. <laughs> <laughs> Only good things, Ben, only good things. <laughs> she said to me once, well, if you're, if you're in it and you need to take another pill, take another pill, I took another pill. It, it, it. Sounds like an echo. Yeah, we don't see you moving. I doubt you're that still. Um, and your mic is off, so I don't know who we were just hearing. Oh, now you're moving, but unmute and we should be good. Get that. Oh, there right. you Sorry go. about that. Yeah, yeah, no, Zoom's been Zoom's been having conniptions this evening. Sorry about that. Um yeah, I was launching into a bunch of nonsense about minimum viable population. Let me cut that and pick up at the exciting part. So um you get the picture. Like the minimum can the minimum can change depending on the genetic variability the genetic richness of the population in question and its relative adaptability so for instance if you have a population of mostly kind of weak kind of stressed out plants that minimum is actually going to be a larger population right because it's going to take more kind of messed up plants to make it through a hard time than it would a group of hardy plants and so this is not also not just the number of plants that are or or mules or whatever that are like liable to make it through a landslide or a drought or a hurricane or whatever. It's also how much genetic variability is going to be left over at the end of that for there to be not a genetic bottleneck and not a uh, a vortex of uh, inbreeding depression. So so you think about like. European royalty with their Habsburg lips and their mental problems and their hemophilia and all that. that that's what happens when you, when you mate with cousins for a couple hundred years. <laughs> Same thing happens for other organisms as well. Um, and that's bad news. That, that doesn't end well. You get World War I out of that if you let it go for too long. So 
we don't want that to happen to our poor plants. So, you know, that's why you need a minimum viable population. That's the viable part. Um, so it's the, the total number that's liable to make it through a hard time and have enough survivors left over at the back end of it to still have a population and keep it going and then grow it back. So moving plants around within a region can boost your local minimum viable population or actually technically shrink your local minimum viable population, but it's like golf. We want to go low. Um, by introducing the genes from the lineages that are endemic indigenous to the place, they're used to the conditions in your local watershed or on whatever geological feature happens to give your soil its particular texture and timbre and flavor, et cetera, in that area, moving stuff around faster than plants can move, you know, use your thumbs, be the mobile parts of the landscape. You know, you can stock the pond essentially in places that are liable to endure for longer and basically help populations of plants endure through the bottleneck time of mass extinction, which is where these extinction events where populations are going below the minimum all over the world in various fits and starts, pick, picks and pockets um, in your area. So it's important because humans are mammals. We live short. We only live a couple of decades, which is a tiny, tiny fraction of time when we're talking about the life of an ecosystem. We've really got to make the most of our minutes and calories and look at those parts of the landscape that are most liable to endure enough for these plants to repopulate. So urban environments are very, very hard landscapes to survive in at all. And yes, as soon as you know municipal budgets stop repairing potholes in the street, you get Detroit where you see a revegetation of large parts of the city, succession ecology kicks back into action and the hills are alive with the sound of verdure uh, once again. However, cities turn over really quickly in the political time scale, in the economic time scale. And so dressing up a vacant lot isn't necessarily a really great long-term uh, or medium-term uh, bet for that area to remain you know, wild and free and growing plants and so on. Out in the country, it's a little different. Um, places that haven't been colonized yet, well, recolonized, re, re, how many colonization waves are around now? Three, four, or five? Depends on how hard your, your area was hit by the 08, before the 08 uh, collapse of the real estate market, I guess. Uh, but anyway, areas that um, are far enough away from profitable centers to not be really appealing to the work from home set and thus are not being chewed up into suburban subdivision or next urban subdivision yet, probably stand a chance to endure f until this economic system, which is chewing up the land, stops doing that. Um, so those would be areas to focus on. Uh, national parks, depending on the mineral resources available underneath of them, may or may not be viable places to focus on for the long term. Private land holdings, depending on what may be got out of uh, more violent expropriation of the land as times get economically tight may or may not be the most viable places for working on this. I will say that thinking about it again in human time frame, working with groups of people stands a much better chance of ensuring for the longer medium term protection of these populations of revegetated species than working with single individuals, whether it's single individual landowners or big trusts or you know rich guys who have big tracts of land, that kind of stuff. You know, when you're working with a community, you have the ability to engage with that community's land ethic, the sense of place, the sense of pride, and particularly in rural environments, that sense of self-identity being tied up with the identity of the land itself is very strong, very, you know, there's a sense not just of protectionism for me, myself, and I, but also a sense of the collective, even if the dominant economic ethos is, you know, some sort of libertarianism or some other individualist silliness, the way people actually live in their lives tends to be fairly collective. So engaging with those sorts of modes, which are still present even in the hyper-capitalized America that we live in, we can 
benefit the land long term by working with the folks who have a material investment in keeping that land land. So that's sort of two angles to that is boost boost the local population such that your local minimum is more robust by uh, repopulating it with local genotype natives from elsewhere within the watershed, elsewhere within the region, and work with groups of individuals rather than in, with, rather than single folks or single organizations not local to place to do this work of planting, tending, bring and so on. So that is very much the little blue stem MO. I mean, that's kind of what we do here um, and how we do it and why we do it. Um, the benefit of that, kind of what, what we're moving towards um, is continuing evolution, continuing life, you know, eukaryotic life on land. Um, we're building refugia. A refugium is any geographical location where the population of organisms stays relatively diverse through an extinction event. So after the retreat of the glaciers, uh, there were refugia where the mountain beaver um, persisted on mountaintops in the California coast ranges long after they went extinct in the valleys as the climate changed. And a large part of the reason for that was local human protection of that species and of the plants that it relied on for its sustenance. Um, so the whole history of the last 10,000 years in North America is very much the history of cultivated refugia. We've done it once on this continent. We can do it again. Um, learn from the pros and continue on ahead. So I'm going to check the chat here. We've got some stuff coming in. Question. Mm -hmm. So if we find some natives that are, if we find some natives that are happy where they are, should we try to increase the number? Yeah. Why not? Check what's going on in the landscape. Um, if it looks like it's a landscape that's not going to be gassed or chopped up or mowed down or whatever, um, one place that you tend to find a whole lot of meadow plants and prairie plants here in Virginia, remnant Piedmont prairie is often in power line cuts because they mow them uh, and they spray them every couple of years to keep the woody perennials out. Um, and so that means that meadow perennials are often able to sustain in there. This is not necessarily a great long-term place for those species because those power lines are only going to be up for as long as the power plants are generating electricity, which is measurable in human time, not necessarily a long-term in, in plant time. There's only so much coal in the ground and only so long it's going to be profitable to dig it and burn it. So um, it's a good place to harvest stuff, but it's not necessarily the best place to really focus on enriching. Whereas edges and borders of agricultural land could potentially stay, you know, plowed and maintained until such time as the climate goes fully tropical here and folks are abandoning the land in favor of, of northern environments, in which case whoever's left is going to have to fend for themselves plant-wise. Um, second question, is it fair to say instead of planting a completely non-native, for instance, Japanese plant, it would do the forest do the least genetic dilution to plant a plant native to a neighboring ecoregion that shares growing conditions like planting a calicarpa native to the southeast United States. Yeah, totally. Um, and I, I argue the point a lot with a colleague of mine in the area who, who has a similar, um, a similar organization to ours, who's very doctrinaire, local genotype overall. Um, there's, there's, one right kind of plant to plant, and that is the plant that is already growing there. Um, I'm like, well, conditions change, man. Um, and we are very much in an any port in a storm kind of a situation. So um, yeah, it, it depends. Like if you're in an area that is an early successional environment surrounded by lots of early successional environment, like again, I'm talking about like a, a suburban subdivision that's all lawn, that's just one one mowing season away from breaking out in wineberry and bittersweet. Um, don't sweat it, just plant whatever. It doesn't really matter. Like it's all, it's all going to be covering kudzu pretty soon anyway. So don't sweat it. Uh, but if you're kind of on the edge of the woods or something like that, then um, yeah, you know, think about how, how your local population 
might be assisted from, um, you know, maybe a little bit more genetic mixing. Assisted migration is a big, uh, a big thing that's worth pursuing as well. And this is tricky to do because you're essentially jumping ahead of, of natural ecological and climatic changes. You know, plants grow where they grow, not just because of their, their drought tolerances, their sunlight tolerances, but also because of their mineral tolerances and their microbial partners. And so if you're going to transplant something non-locally, also think about transplanting a little bit of that soil so you get some of those microbes as well, all the, the soil mycorrhiza that most plants depend on, um, and also the, the unsung heroes, the, the protists in their many teeming millions uh, and soil bacteria as well. Um, but also think about you know species that are more southerly to you that might grow in your region as patterns seem like they're, they're changing. So for instance, in North Carolina, after the hemlock woolly adelgid killed a bunch of hemlock trees, um, all along a bunch of trout streams, folks planted um, cypress, bald cypress from the south. So down from South Carolina and from North Florida and from Georgia, bald cypresses were planted along the stream sides and that they grew well, they were well within their temperature tolerances, well within the soil tolerances and the shade from their branches kept the trout streams cool enough for the trout to still make more trout in them. So this would be early days yet, but it seems promising for that kind of transplanting. Um, armadillos have been moving north ever since the Isthmus of Panama was a thing. Um, that's just their own natural migration. You could probably assist that uh, if you had some time in a, a box truck on your hands. Um, <laughs> shaking your head, say, no, please don't do that. Um, Palmetto is a, is a shrub that has a pretty high um, cold tolerance for a, a subtropical. There are tons of plants that are more southerly to us that could grow uh, endemically uh, farther to the north, plants from the coast that can grow further inland. Um, so all of this stuff, again, engage with very carefully. This is not just a thing to do cavalierly. You'd have to study it. You have to research what folks are already doing, work on this. You have to to learn at the very least what the symbiotes are, um, what the effect of this organism, what it's, this organism's home ecosystem is like, and if something comparable is around here, and if it's not going to interrupt things too dramatically by, say, injecting a whole bunch of lilopathic chemicals through its root system that deter the, uh, the growth of other seeds of endemic, currently endemic plants around it. But again, human beings have been moving plants around for as long as there have been human beings on the continent, which is longer than this current um, bioecological horizon. You know, there were, there were glaciers on here before, after, before, and after there were human beings. So we've already been through several interglacial modes in which, you know, homin humans, hominids, hominins affected the, the biogeography of eastern U.S., um, all right, let's see. I got some more, more questions here. Should we let aggressive natives do what they do and see what happens, or try some non-poisonous control? Um, again, depends on are there are there armadillos in Virginia? I think there's some down in the south. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I've uh -huh. never seen one. Okay, I guess they don't get through the Carolinas. There's some. They're in South Carolina, I think. They're through Georgia. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I uh, I heard it would be. Uh, when I was a kid, um, they told me there was going to be armadillos in Maryland. I grew up in Maryland. There, there would be armadillos in Maryland within the millennium, um, <laughs> just on their natural their natural migration northwards. That seems pretty fast to me, but that might have been wrong. Um, yeah, don't do the thing with the box trucks and armadillos. I was exaggerating. <laughs> uh, yeah, so as far as uh, controlling... Uh, aggressive natives. So you're thinking like wing stem or something like that, that'll just uh, totally, totally grow like wild. A lot of plants that tend to grow rampantly, so grow a whole bunch all at once, send out a bunch of seed, um, have fairly high viability for their seed, are able to, to cope with a, a wide array of, um, of calamity as well as, as ambient extremes, tend to be early succession species. So relatively early in the lifespan of a landscape, the succession from bare ground to old field to early forest and so on. That's when you're going to find these sort of generalists, hardy generalists. So if you see a plant that's going rampant, that usually is an indication that you're early in successional cycle. 
where you find rampant plants in something that looks like a a later succession environment like a forest you go what are all the, what's all this bittersweet doing in here what's all this vinca doing in here well there may be some some complicating elements that led to parts of that landscape being more early succession say compaction from logging efforts or from somebody running hogs through that woods at some point within the past century or from an overabundance of non-native european earthworms which has totally changed the organic cycling, organic material cycling in the forest all up and down the east coast of North America. So um, generally, if you see a bunch of rampants, it means the land is tending to itself. You can kind of try to cut in and try to accelerate the successional model through creative planting as well as through soil aeration and a ton of other different things. But again, it's one of those things where you want to study the situation in situ before just diving in thinking that, you know, because you've got a couple books on permaculture on your shelf, you know better than these organisms that have been dealing with this for millions and millions and millions of years. So with caution. Question, we have fence lizards and skinks and little red efts, but I've never seen an armadillo. <laughs> oh man, I put my foot into it. Armadillo have reached North Carolina. All right, probably, probably Southern part. All right, all right, I was right about that. Armadillos. <laughs> Just track these things are coming north. Um, all right. So I guess the last um, just little tidbit that I have on my notes here, I wanted to mention that um, stable hybrids are producing novel species all the time. Um, you know, speciation is occurring constantly. The evolution is, is never, never stops for neither rain nor snow nor sleet nor hail. Um, so in North Scotland, um, one of the most recently recognized, recently evolved species is the Mimulus peregrinus, the Shetland monkey flower. And this represents an interesting case because it is the descendant, the immediate descendant of species which the British government has, or the UK government has been specifically targeting for eradication as invasive species. It's a monkey flower that I believe was, was endemic to California that was spread uh, via gardeners in the the late 1800s, early 1900s, that escaped and went and went uh, endemic or invasive, perhaps up there, and it it done did an evolution. It a uh, stable triploid hybrid formed, and uh, now this tiny population of plants that's genetically unique from its forebears and is internally consistent within itself. Uh, genotypically and phenotypically, now has to be this protected species, despite being the child of plants that everybody wants to kill because they're horrible invasives. So think about that with everyone. You look at every stand of Alanthus trees or bittersweet vine, or even I have to remind myself every time I see a patch of vinca, which is I have very, there are very few kill on site organisms in my life, but vinca, man, it's tough not to want to get rid of that stuff. Um, <laughs> but you know. There's a time and a place for everything. I recognize the pattern of the landscape and I've yet to see a pattern that, but once Vinca there, but you know, that probably is just because I'm impatient, frankly. Um, so yeah, you know, things change all the time. What we think of as, as rampant non-native species may, if things keep going as they're going uh, and capitalism still keeps capitalizing, might be the only green stuff left on the continents, in which case we'll be really glad that it's hardy and adaptable and there. And we'll look back on our time when we tried to kill the stuff with, you know, chemical warfare, weapons agents, uh, and soak the soil and kill all of, all of the, uh, the frogs in the creek while we were at it, uh, as perhaps maybe hitting the wrong target. Um, Bittersweet is my vinca. So <laughs> I hear that. It makes nice baskets and uh, and it's really good forage for birds in areas where a lot of their native winter forage has been extirpated to turn it into housing subdivisions and so on. So it's part of the reason why you find it everywhere is that birds like eating it so bloody much. Um, you know, they'll eat it, they'll poop it out on fence rows and, you know, trees and so on. Um, yeah, it'll absolutely strangle a tree on the edge of the woods. Um, so funny story about bittersweet around here. So um, Little Blue Stem HQ is my big backyard here in, in Nelson County, Virginia, which is in a hollow. It's a hollow inside of a hollow. 
real interesting plant population there. And at the edge of it, because it was a hog field for, you know, about 20 years is a ton of bittersweet. And so wanting to establish an area. So we've, we've been establishing planting zones for a lot of the plants that we grow in the nursery. And so in one area we decided, all right, this is all just this overgrown thicket of bittersweet. It's probably fine if we just rip all this stuff out and then replant it with, uh, you know, oat grass and, and whatever. Um, so we did that. And uh, as we were pulling it out, we we're like, huh, that's weird. Like all this bittersweet, all this young bittersweet is one young, like it's been here for a long time, but um, the roots look like, you know, they're pretty big roots, but they're not sending out really big shoots. Like some of them are, are crowning the, the maple trees around us, but most of it is staying fairly low to the ground and there's a lot of browse damage on there. So what's going on? Is it caterpillar browse? No, there's, it looks like deer browse. Like, okay, well, it's, it's fawning season right now. So it's probably the fawns and their mothers eating a lot of bittersweet. And they really seem to be going after it, like more than anything else. They're really going after the bittersweet in this area. So we tore out all the bittersweet and the next day the deer ate all of the squashes in my garden because <laughs> we just took away all of their forage. So again, everything, there's, there's a pattern in everything and it's different in different locations. Maybe the deer aren't, aren't really going after the bittersweet where you are. Um, but it was a really clear, you messed with our favorite food, so we're going to mess with your favorite food kind of a thing. Um, so what is the name of your podcast so we can follow along? It is called By the Seed of Our Plants. So help me. Um, it is it is Ben and I, and uh, sometimes our buddy Charlie is on as a third mic, and uh, we talk to people all over the place. If you know of anybody who you think might be interested to be interviewed or interesting to talk to, uh, please hit us up. Um, I think my contact info is probably somewhere in the notes. Um, but yeah, give us a holler. Um, and you can listen to it on our website, littlebluestem.net. There's a direct link to it. Uh, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash buy the seed of our plants. If you want to kick us a couple of bucks to keep the lights on. Um, and it's also available. So SoundCloud and, uh, you know, Spotify and all those other, um, wherever, wherever podcasts are sold. This one's free. All right. Okay. Any more questions? I think our brains are full. That's great. <laughs> ben, it's been a pleasure. Um, you're obviously a genius and we really appreciate you sharing probably just the tip of the iceberg of all of the thoughts that you've had about this in particular, but lots of other things I'm sure you could share with us. Um, we appreciate what you're doing. So keep up that strong work in Virginia. We look forward to seeing you again in a few months with another talk uh, in case anybody missed Ben said he was going to give another presentation in the future talking about um, co-planting native plants um, I am blanking on what we were going to call that um, edible landscapes companion planting with natives that's thank you very much Audrey Audrey to the rescue thanks and thanks, Audrey, for uh, for reaching out and for for inviting us to hang out with you all this evening. Thank you for coming, Ben. It was awesome. Yep. For all sure. right, guys. Just telling Jesse how wonderful it was to work with you um, in our garden in Barbersville. So. Oh yeah. It's yeah, nice yeah, to no, reconnect with you. Out there. Yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. All right, if uh, everybody is all done with Ben, we're gonna move on to the next part here. Let me bring it back up. I think it'll be this one. Yeah, look at that, okay. There we go. So um, now that our brains are full, we have to think about our chapter business and it's exciting time right now. Um, it's our nomination slate for our elections that will be held next month at our meeting. All of our chapter members can vote at the meeting. Um, Susan probably has all of the really important detailed information about what percentage of us have to be there to make it official and all of that stuff. Uh, but thinking about the simple math, we have 160 
you know, what I say, 146 members in the chapter, and we have between 18 and 24 that typically come to a meeting. So we're right around that 10% mark. So I, my guess is the bylaws probably say we have to have more than that to have an official count, but we're going to work with what we get. Um, I believe as it stands today, our board of directors will be myself, Marilyn, Denise, and Susan, uh, but our officer position is going to change a little bit. We're going to have our vice president position open and our membership chair position open. Um, we appreciate everything that Audrey has done for us and she promises she's not going to go far and she's still going to be uh, helping us out. She's just stepping away from this actual title. Um, and our membership chair position, little secret, I've been doing that the whole time. Uh, so I would really love to fill that because it has been a pleasure for the last two years doing um, everything that, that gets this chapter running with the help of Susan and Audrey and Denise and Marilyn, but it's unsustainable to keep at this pace for much longer. And I need help. We need help to make the chapter grow. We need help to do all the great things that we want to do. Um, it's really fun to do this, but you can only have so much fun for so long before you're exhausted, even by fun things. And I don't want it to be a burden and I don't want it to be a job. I already have one of those. So we need more help. Jesse, could you maybe just explain real quickly what the membership chair does? Because that might help people decide whether they could take that on. And cue the next slide. I have <laughs> all of the um, descriptions for the different, there's also another slide after this, but for each of the positions, there's a um, kind of just a, a little blurb about what is required. And obviously, if I have been doing, you know, more than one role, and Susan's really been doing more, we've all been doing more than one role, um, it is manageable to do it, to, to take on one role uh, and, and keep it you know, reasonable. Um, we're all volunteers. We all have, you know, busy lives and other things that take our time too, but it is manageable and especially with more hands to make the chapter everything that it could be. Um, and I think if I can just jump in membership chair, it says maintain the membership records, but national does that. You can download when you're an officer, you can download the roster from National, and it's all right there with contact information. It's sortable. It's an Excel file. So it's not something that the membership chair has to actually keep track of. Just every time you get a new member notification, download the new one from National, and there you are. Yep. Um, and Jesse has the contact list, which I'm sure you'll share with the membership chair, and you can just send out emails automatically. It's really pretty automated. Um, and I think coordinating the dues payments with the treasurer is probably the most, Jesse, is that right? The one of the, or is that easy too? I've never done that. The, I don't really even um, do anything with that. The, okay. The National main, does it all, don't they? The main time that I spend um, in the membership chair side of it, which is a, it's important time, but we will get emails in asking about information about the chapter. Um, and I already have a generated lengthy new um, email that I send to them. Uh, usually they don't have a question that falls outside of that already composed email. Sometimes they do and you just, you know, switch it up a little bit. Um, so it's answering those questions, giving information about the chapter. And when new members join, you probably, anybody who joined the chapter probably got an email from me that said, hey, welcome to the chapter. This is the stuff we do. These are all of our contact things. This is the next meeting. This is the newest newsletter, like welcoming and inviting. Um, if you have things you wanna share with us, please send it along. I'd love to announce that at a meeting. It, it's that kind of thing. So um, that takes up time also. Again, it's already composed. I just- It's all formatted, right? It's, yeah, yeah, it's getting that out there. And yep. then the, the third thing that is the most time consuming, is when we do tabling events and we collect uh, emails, every person that puts down their email gets entered into the 
email list and then get sent those emails. So that's time consuming like data input stuff. But even with all of that, we're talking a couple hours here and there, not like every day I'm, I'm slogging away at this. Uh, so it is manageable, it's doable. Um, hopefully it's doable by somebody else soon. Speaking of which, um, okay, so I'm not sure if I switched slides. I'll give this one a second. This is our other um, opportunities. We don't currently have a program chair. I, We've all been collectively working on that because when we get these great speakers like Ben and we um, get presentations offered to us at different sites or we do garden tours or we do those, things, we've been putting those together. But if there's someone who wants to put together a program uh, for the year, you know, that would be, if you're excited to do those things, which I am, I love making those connections and those event things, but that would be, you know, even more opportunity to help the chapter. We do a lot of um, educational outreach and there, are, so I just wanted to give a brief glimpse into why we need so much help. So um, our chapter, has been represented at 11 different events this year, many of which were multiple day or, or multiple day and multiple venue events. Um, they're exciting opportunities to talk to people who have a wide range of knowledge and interest, some of whom don't know anything about natives and some who have done great projects and they wanna talk to like-minded people about them. And they're very excited. It's always great to meet them. We've been e able to reach and teach hundreds of people at these events. But of those 11 events, one of the events was manned by 14 chapter members in an amazing show of support. And um, it was a multi-day event, 14 different people picked up slots. And so all of those people got to interact with all, all of the public, hundreds of people. One of the 11 events didn't have anybody man it. It was just a poster we put together, but we were represented as wild ones. One event of the 11 was a different member of the chapter who set up a table at a local event near her to tell people about wild ones. So she had our tablecloth and our, our table set up essentially, and was just telling people, you know, her experience with wild ones and talked about whatever. Um, she had going on in her property and her community. So that was a great event. So that's three out of the 11. The other eight tabling events were just me and my family who are members of the chapter, but, um, and we have a great time. And this event that I'm showing you on this page was just my husband because I had to work and he ran two tables and is an amazing proponent for native plants in the landscape and uses every platform available to tell people about this. But it's not sustainable for us to do eight of the 11 events. And we want to have a presence in these communities to tell people about this important message and the work that we do. So uh, people probably aren't aware that that is the scope of the problem. Um, because we want to be able to do even more events, but I can't even commit to do eight events next year. I just, my steam is running a little low. So if you are interested in helping even with those things, or when the call comes out that says, hey, we're doing a community event, can you help us man the table? That's, that's what I mean. Just come sit. You get to sit out in the beautiful sunshine and talk about native plants. Um, the whole setup is already together and ready. Uh, you do have to put it up, but I mean, you don't have to go buy anything or bring anything. It's all in a box. You put it up, you sit there and talk about native plants and you don't have to be an expert. You just have to share your passion, the resources that we have available um, and get the message out there. And, and you will meet people who've never heard of the concept or um, other people who really love to already talk about it. And their eyes light up when they see an organization that is talking about the things that they love. Moving on, our chapter um, financial report. Thank you, Denise, for getting this ready for us. Our balance is very healthy. We have um, 
over $2,000 to do projects with. And if we have the people to be able to make those projects happen, we can do a lot of great things. We did make a payment to the Wild Seed Project for their presentation last month. We paid to be at the Green Earth Festival, which is one of those tabling events. Um, and we got our dues reimbursement for the third quarter. So that's how we came to that balance. Um, that brings us to one of my favorite parts of every meeting, uh, unless I should, I'm gonna pause right before the thought of the month here to check the chat and see if there's anything. Um, yes, how can we get more members involved in the monthly meetings? It's a great question, Marilyn. And I think that the, it's a trade-off. The um, benefit of being able to record the meetings and post them puts them at a lower priority when there are conflicts in people's schedules because they can just check in with the recording later, but you miss that, that FaceTime and that real life um, conversation that we end up having. So if anybody has, a, I don't know, we need to tell everybody else they can't have an event on the night we're gonna have a meeting, or we need to say, you have to come or you miss it. And I don't wanna do that. I think our, our information and the things Ben said tonight are too important to only happen in real time. I want people to be able to, to review that, to go back and, and have the best of both worlds. So it's a tricky question. I, I don't know how to best address it. I also think I thought I saw, I thought I saw a hand up and I'm not sure what that might've meant, but if so, anybody, anytime, if you wanna talk, just unmute and let me know your thoughts. You can interrupt me. I interrupt me. The, the hand was me and it was oh. more about the membership. <laughs> um reinforcement and the renewal notifications that all runs through national as yes. well correct yes. so the membership chair wouldn't have to send out chase people down for dues or chase people down for renewals that's all done through the national it is correct i have never sent somebody a message that said hey you renewed or you um expired i feel like we are all very capable functioning adults. And um, we're gonna choose to put our time and energy and money where we want to. And National already takes care of chasing you for money. Uh, I don't need to do that. If you wanna come spend time with us, I'm more than happy to have you, but you get the notices and you can choose to do with that what you want. And I would rather have people who are fully engaged and want to be there and not just say yes to me because I emailed them at 19th time. Um, so, so right, we don't chase people for sure. Um, Audrey, are you all set for our thought of the month? I am, yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay, so um, what led me to this, sadly, uh, were many dead birds hitting our windows um, that you see here in these pictures. Um, in our new place in Virginia. So I reached out to Jesse and Susan and Marilyn and Denise and Lindy and said, you know, do you guys have any solutions? So we went on a wild goose chase to, um, no pun intended, to figure out how we could help save these birds from, from hitting the windows. And uh, here's some of the stuff that we found. Um, Jesse, that video, the YouTube video, um, are you able to play that? I can, yep. Um, that real short one, it's like 36 seconds or something. Is it the one about putting- Have you considered going solar in Pennsylvania, but afraid of the huge price tag attached? Most people don't know this, but almost 100% of homeowners make the switch for- is Yep, this is it. This mm -hmm. is it, okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. So essentially that is what birds see. 
Um, so now you can you can see why they fly into the windows. Um, uh, one of the many reasons we grow native plants is to attract birds to our yards. Unfortunately, this can lead to birds being injured or killed from flying into windows and glass doors. Birds cannot see glass as we can. They only see what's reflected in the glass, which is often trees and sky. Essentially, windows act like mirrors and confuse birds into thinking that they are flying into habitat. Spring and fall are particularly difficult times as many birds are migrating. To stop birds from striking glass, the whole area needs to look like a barrier to them. So what can we do to provide the visual clues birds need to quote unquote, see the glass? Markings can be made with stickers or decals. You can also use a paint marker pen such as Crayola window writers to draw lines or anything else you like to fill the space. These lines can be scraped away easily with a credit card or washed off. If you need something that is quick, easy and inexpensive, use a bar of soap to draw on your windows. Marilyn suggested this to me. So we drew lines with soap down our windows while we decide on a more permanent solution because the windows above the ones you see are oddly shaped. Uh, this has been mostly effective, but not a complete fix. But you can see how the um, window just acts as a mirror. You can see the reflection of the trees. And then you can see on the left side where we have the soap, um, and that was just <laughs> obviously really quick. We did not use you know anything to make sure it was straight or whatever. It was just you know the it was let's get this done now so that no more birds die. Um, but you can see how it disrupts that reflection, and and it's pretty effective. Uh, the key with um, with doing this is you want to apply markings to your windows or doors very densely, leaving gaps no larger than two by two inches. Otherwise, birds may try to fly through them. We obviously have small birds too. Uh, markings should be high in contrast so they stand out. Each marking should be at least one quarter inch wide. The entire glass area should be covered. Markings must be applied to the outside of the window. Remember that the reflections may make indoor markings invisible to birds. This is also why closing the curtains or blinds inside the house does not work. We tried it. The exception is when closing blinds stops the see-through effect from windows opposite one another or along a glass corridor in your home or in the sunroom. Uh, there are also some other options, including applying a window film, such as you sometimes see to make a window appear to be frosted. Other films mimic the look of window panes or decorative window grills, so you can find something that you might like. There's also feather-friendly DIY tape, which can be purchased online at featherfriendly.com or at Wild Birds Unlimited. There's another product um, called a bird screen, and that is what it sounds like, a screen that attaches to the outside of your window. The nice thing about it is that it uses suction cups, so it's really easy to put up and really easy to take off when you're done with it. Um, you can get that at birdscreen.com. Uh, you can also hang ribbon or string every four inches down the windows or other, or order parachute cords from birdsavers.com. Birdsavers also sells a pre-made version with the parachute cords that they call Zen Wind Curtains. And these are really popular with commercial buildings um, and Audubon recommends them as well. Um, if you're going to replace your windows anyway, it would be a good time to look into special bird-friendly glasses like etched glass, fritted glass, or UV-coated glass. And we'll be talking about this in an upcoming meeting, but another big problem is lighting, particularly outdoor or landscape lighting. Leaving lights on all night can result in nighttime collisions with windows and walls, and can also keep birds circling in the air in confusion until dawn. So turn off those lights at night and add some visual cues to your windows, especially during times of migration or when you notice young birds learning to fly so we can all help birds stay in flight. Yeah, thank you, Audrey. That was, uh, it's very timely and pertinent um, information. I hope everybody takes to heart. I also, I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but um, I've heard keeping your screens in your window also helps because it decreases that glare and then you don't have the reflection. So if you have windows with screens, 
though it can impair your bird watching, um, it may help save the birds. Yep, but it's just if, if it's on the outside, if your screens are on the outside right. of the windows, um, because ours are on the inside, and so they're, they're still hitting in, unfortunately. Um, gotcha. Not those that you see, but other windows as well. Gotcha. Um, check in the chat quick before we move on. Outside screens, yeah, yeah. I must, must have outside screens, and that's why I only thought that's the way they were. I, mm -hmm. Now that you're saying that, I'm like, oh, I don't know now. Okay. <laughs> um, that's funny. And next is our tree of the month. One of my yeah, just I'm favorites. sorry. Give me, give me a second because I'm trying to find it in my email. Here. No problem. Would you like me to start with uh, the video? Um, I, I did find it, so I'm good to go. Um, okay. If we could do the video after, that'd be great. Sounds great. Okay, so our tree of the month is shagbark hickory. And I've, I don't know, I've seen this pronounced or heard it pronounced several ways. I'm just going to go with caria ovata. Among the, the many beautiful hickories, of the oak hickory forest is the distinctive shagbark hickory, obviously named for its interesting and unusual bark. Shagbarks are large and long-lived but slow-growing trees. Mature trees can reach 70 to 100 feet tall and about 50 to 70 feet wide. Hickories have deep tap roots, which can make them difficult to transplant. The tap roots can grow two to three feet in the first few years, so it's important to find a nursery who knows how to grow them properly. Go Native Trees near Lancaster specializes in growing hickories and they tell you about how they grow them as well as how not to grow them on their website, gonativetrees.com. Shagbark hickories are adaptable to a variety of soils, tolerant of clay soils and drought, but not flooding as they prefer well-drained soil and also full sun. Leaves are alternate, pinnately compound with five and sometimes seven finely toothed leaflets, including a large terminal leaf. Fall color is golden yellow. It's pretty gray bark starts out smooth and gets shaggy with age. Deer typically don't bother shagbarks over eight feet tall, but protect smaller trees from browse and antler rubbing. In April, yellow green catkins form and in October, brown nuts feed birds like turkey, squirrels, chipmunks, mice, raccoons, fox, rabbits, people, and my dog, Sophie. I tried to get a picture of her eating these nuts because she does this probably five times a day, but uh, she didn't cooperate. The trees are also valuable for larvae of moths and butterflies, including hickory and banded hair streak butterflies and underwing moths. The tree's shaggy bark plates protrude from the trunk, providing lots of hiding places for insects, small birds, and bats. And then we have a little video with some more information. Audrey, I'm going to show the color one first, I think. Okay, cool. Yeah, we thought this would uh, speak volumes instead of me trying to, to explain and describe the color. It's just really pretty. Lenny Farley, Purdue University Extension Forester. Now let's ID that tree. In this fall edition of ID That Tree, we've got a uh, kind of a rare event here. We usually don't think of the hickories as being particularly bright fall color. But in fact, some species on occasion will produce some really nice yellows and golds. In this case, we've got shagbark hickory that's producing a really nice display of uh, deep yellows. Really great with a nice bright sunny day backlighting this species. Oftentimes to get these kind of displays, the tree needs to be out in more or less full sunlight. And there seems to also be some genetic control on this as well. So uh, another one of our Indiana hardwoods not to discount for fall color. And as we mentioned earlier, the yellows are typically associated with uh, carotenoids that are a pigment that is in the leaf through the growing season, but is exposed as the chlorophyll gradually breaks down in the fall. And... Caria ovata, shagbark hickory. These are trees 60 to 80 feet high. The shape is oblong with ascending and descending branches. 
The foliage type is deciduous and leaves are alternately arranged. The leaf shape is pinnately compound, leaflets are oblong, and margins are serrate. The overall leaf size is 8 to 14 inches long, usually with five leaflets, although rarely seven. Leaflets are five to seven inches long and one half to two and a half inches wide. Individual leaflets may be elliptic to oblong lanceolate. The larger leaflet size will help you differentiate this from other carrier species. The leaf color is a deep yellow green during the summer and will be pubescent and glandular below when young, finely turning glabrous. Fall color is between yellow and golden brown. Ornamental features for Caria ovata include a gray-brown bark which flakes off the tree in long flat plates, creates a shaggy appearance, giving the common name shagbark hickory. Being that the shaggy bark is present year-round, this makes an excellent ID feature. Caria ovata produces a round fruit with a sweet tasting seed. Cultural information for Caria ovata. These are hardy from zones four to eight and do best in full sun. They tolerate acidic to alkaline soil conditions, pH five to eight. They have no major insect and disease issues. They are native in Iowa, the Eastern USA and Canada. Notes for Caria ovata. Stems are usually fairly stout and can be somewhat downy, although may be smooth and shining. Stems are reddish brown to light gray in color. These can be difficult to transplant because of an extensive taproot. When the leaves are bruised, they often have a faint smell of apples. The fruit is nearly round or globose in shape, one inch to one and a half inches in diameter, and the nut has a very thick wall, a quarter inch to three eighths of an inch. Hickory chips for barbecue are often made from Caria ovata. Excellent information. Yeah, they're really, really pretty right now. There are a lot of hickories in the woods where I live and um, just they just light everything up. Really beautiful tree. And the bark on the shag bark is super cool. And um, adult butterflies, moths, and even bats can roost under them for overwintering purposes. Mm -hmm. So that's very exciting. They also take a really long time to produce seeds. Uh, I, I convinced Justin we needed to have one of these and we needed to get it immediately because it takes 40 years for it to produce its first seeds. So I, I got one, it was the most expensive tree I've gotten. It's just a tiny little thing. But I said, babe, we're gonna die before it produces any fruit. So we need to put it in the ground now so we have a chance of seeing that first harvest when we're you know old and hobbling around. So I'll let you know in 40 years if uh, I get my to see my first nuts on the shed. Okay, we're we're going to hold you to that. That's right. Uh, okay, let's see. I need to go this one. I think that takes us to and say not the black screen of death, I hope. But um, let me check the chat real quick. Um, uh, or you haven't dropped the storm. I don't have storm windows. I think it's a screen thing that I just, I'm, I'm not a screen proficionado. Um, upcoming opportunities, guys. Really exciting stuff coming up, maybe. Okay. I'm sure all of you, if you're a member of Wild Ones, got the email from National saying, hey, um, what do you think about our branding stuff? I'm not sure if everybody got the email that said, um, said about the things on this screen. So new climate resilient landscapes, a guide, as well as copies of our reprinted native garden designs guide. These two things that I'm showing you here um, were mailed out. I have a, two big heavy boxes. So whenever we get together in person, I will bring them and you can have your very own climate resilient landscape booklet. Uh, on the website, the national website, nativegardendesigns.wildones.org, these garden designs are there. The exciting part about that is 
they are developing a Philadelphia area, that's as close as we're gonna get, um, design. So that will be another great resource and reference that we can give to people who are saying, hey, I live on this plot or that plot or this kind of an area, I just want an idea, a blueprint that I can kind of follow, I can change around a little bit but it'll give them an idea. So we're getting a Philadelphia area one. These 10 new designs will soon be finalized and viewable, downloadable um, at the website. That is open to the public, that portion, that um, nativegardendesigns.wildones.org. They developed those from a grant. It's open to the public because it's a great educational piece. So that's exciting, that's coming up. This is also exciting. Um, the Ohio State University does amazing presentations starting tomorrow and every Friday at 10 a.m. through November 11th. They'll have these different presenters talking about pollinator habitat 101. Our, I almost said Lord and Savior, but that's almost accurate. Um, Doug Tallamy will be talking tomorrow. And some people that I've not heard from yet, so I'm excited. Heather Holm always does a great presentation. So they're free. You click that link and you register all in one spot. And then you get um, the email that gives you the recording, but you can also find it on the OSU website with a little bit of digging to find the recordings. They're all worth it. They've had them at least for the last few years. And you can look at, at all of their old uh, education too. It's great. Um, another really interesting opportunity. I got an email from um, Edge of the Woods Nursery and they, in collaboration um, with this organization, are they're doing essentially a tour about this Hercules Meadow project. It says, we invite you to see how Buzzy Unisem USA has brought life to a 20 acre agricultural field. Take a tour with us on Friday, October 21st. You will see a thriving mature meadow complete with a native fruit orchard, an American chestnut experimental grove, a colonial outpost location and learn about a local cement plants commitment to the environment through this effort. You're invited to help celebrate the ninth anniversary of the Hercules Meadow. Although 10 is the more common anniversary celebration, this is anything but common. Converting land to a sustainable, diverse preserve, truly a land of learning. In November 2013, the Stalker Town plant of Buzzy Unisem USA broke ground for a 20 acre meadow on land formerly monocropped. This would become a meadow using plants native to Northampton County and Eastern Pennsylvania. And there would be eight acres dedicated to growing green fuel for the cement kilns. With the assistance of Edge of the Woods Native Plant Nursery, the meadow was established with a variety of perennials and grasses that support pollinators, birds, and butterflies. Native trees and shrubs were introduced, creating a diverse landscape and protecting the habitat for all wildlife. The site has served as an outdoor classroom for four local school districts. Numerous bird, butterfly, and insect species have been documented on the site since its conversion to a preserve. We invite you to see how Buzzy Unisem USA has brought life to this landscape. Um, I read that part. Light refreshments will be offered. You will be transported from the parking site to the meadow via a shuttle bus. It's an outdoor event. Please dress for the weather, wear sturdy shoes, how rain or shine. In the event of dangerous weather, it'll be rescheduled to the following Friday. Uh, you will be notified at the email address used for registration by noon on Friday if they need to reschedule. And if you register and then you're unable to attend, they ask that you cancel your registration so they can get to people who are on a wait list. So, that sounds really exciting. I also have no idea where Stalker Town is. Um, so you'd have to, the address is there. There is a disclaimer that that address is not the exact address for the meadow. It's uh, probably where that shuttle bus will be. So you can't just show up. Um, but if it's within driving distance or you're interested and you're available, it sounds like an amazing opportunity to see a project on a large scale. Um, and I wanted to share it with you guys. Some other great things, Penn State Extension is doing a series on native plants. 
They are five dollars um, for an hour. I have not attended any of these, so I just wanted to share the opportunity, but I can't speak to what level they're really talking about. This is Know Your Native Seeds. It happens on Wednesday, October 26th. Know Your Native Shrubs is Wednesday, November 2nd. And um, Know Your Native's Underappreciated Plants is Wednesday, November 9th. So I have the direct links to register up here, or you can probably search them on the extension website. That takes us to the end of our October meeting. Next month, we'll be um, very excited to have Mark come back and talk shrubs with us for four season interest. Always love to have him. In December, we are talking to Susan from the Hardy Plant Society about seed collection. And this is our nursery list, but for those of you who have stuck around, I want to share just a sneak peek of next year. And this is to entice everybody who's thinking about wanting to volunteer and be um, an officer or be, you know, more involved. Oh, this isn't it. I'm sorry. This is it. We already have half of the year pretty much planned out. Uh, we have all of the dates for all of our meetings for next year already, um, except for April, we need to kind of work that out with our speakers. But how exciting, you could step into a role as an officer and already have half the year done for you. So um, it's only a sneak peek, you can't study it, it's going away. But I also, so Marilyn earlier had said about uh, aggressive natives and should we lead them or should we not? Well, you can tell what I do, Marilyn. Um, this is just a small section of my property that um, I was told I can't call it heath aster. It's probably not heath aster. It is old field aster or Symphiotrichum pilosum that is very happy. There's also snake root in there and there's goldenrod, which I'm also told I shouldn't say is Canadian goldenrod because it probably isn't. It's probably altissima or tall goldenrod. So uh, that's the fun part of having a botanist stop by your mess of a yard and get to tell you the fun stuff you've been naming wrong all this time. So uh, this is kind of what I do. It's happy there. I didn't plant any of that, uh, but I really like it. And uh, this is the meadow that I planted from seed. This was just before we got all this rain. So you can see I didn't plant all of that Symphiotrichum pilosum, but it found its way in there and it's very happy. There's also some stuff in there from the seed mix that um, might make it through all that competition, but uh, that is really fun to see. And now I wonder exactly how I'm gonna chop it down in March, but uh, I'll get in there somehow with a machete maybe. Uh, and this is, Kind of what it looks like right now here uh, lots of snow banks of that old field aster um lots uh that my trees haven't started changing color very much at all i also don't have my pool covered yet so don't judge but um that's a problem for another time uh so i'll let you know next month when i get some more colorful pictures as it cools down and the trees start changing more vigorously but uh when people say nothing's blooming you know what it's the season's over it's not there's lots of stuff still still hanging in there um if you just let it be and this is my prized pokeweed stand uh, i have several pokeweed stands this one is at the base of um my very dead tree that I love so much, the dead tree. And I'm sure they all got there because the birds love to go in the dead tree and poop after they've eaten berries from somewhere else. So it is an amazingly vigorous stand full of cat birds all the time uh, because they just love those berries so much. So that's a fun little spot that I have going on right now too. Okay, and then that takes us to the sneak peek. So I'm gonna stop sharing. And if anybody has anything else they wanna share, 
Um, so I'm looking at the chat now. Yes, bumblebees, all sorts of different fun bees. And I keep thinking it's so chilly. Aren't you guys like ready to hunker down yet? But they're they're still they're still at it. Um, let's see. Blue wood aster, white wood aster, blue mist flower, all still blooming too. Completely agree. Uh, and this is the first year I've had blue mist flower volunteering in other places. So that's fun. It's finally like taken off. Um, yes, those are all great. So huge asters aren't frost asters. So Donna, I was always calling them frost asters also. That's what I thought was just uh, like a common name for them. But apparently frost aster is a specific species of aster that is less common. And pelosum is the more common aster that is found in just old fields. So that common name is old field aster. Uh, yeah, so who knew? So it is pelosum? It is S. pelosum? It is, Symphiotrichum pelosum. Now, Great. it it took a literal botanist to differentiate the two. So I don't think anybody will fault us not being actual botanists if we use one or the other kind of interchangeably. But they're both, from what I understand, fairly woody on the aster side. They're like, they're big, they're bulky plants and they keep, they're not woody, you know, they die all the way to the ground, but they are sturdy and will hold that stem for several years if you don't cut it. They also will bloom at like four inches. If you trim them, cut them down, like mow them, they will bloom at whatever height you allow them to live at. It is amazing. Um, that would be one of those uh, aggressive plants that you wouldn't want to leave. I mean, they look so pretty in your yard. Uh, they seem to be happy. I only take them out if I um, am trying to establish something else or I'll just like pull them back. I've gifted them to people. I hope, Susan, have they taken off as well at your place too? <laughs> yeah, they are just, they're happy. They're happy, easy critters and I like them. And they're so great this time of year. Yeah. Really wonderful. Yep. And you can like, you can almost um, prune them to whatever you need. Like they, if they flop or if they're just, you know, bigger over a pathway, I just trim off a couple branches and they're fine. They Perfect. just keep on trucking. Yeah. Cool. So Jesse, this is an example of just what Ben was talking about. <laughs> I mean, you Full guys second. all know, I, I just let it, let it do its thing. Everything's happier then where I can. And it's less work for me. So instead <laughs> of like working at it, I just get to go watch all the bees and the right, fun stuff. Right. Yep. Uh, what else do we need? Do we need to talk about anything else? Is anybody super motivated to come join us on our very fun cool kids club of running the chapter. I'll give you time to think about it. It's okay. <laughs> this is where you start seeing everybody hang up. <laughs> yeah, we're there. See ya. Bye. Gotta go. Oh, look at the time. <laughs> I'm already running too many things. I know. And you know, everybody has their own season. I totally get it. I wasn't ready for this five years ago. And I may not be ready for it in two years, so we'll see. Well, I'm glad you all guys are here. It's always nice to see this group. It's a fun night of the week or month yeah. or. Yeah. Marilyn, are Thank you back you, from Maine? Yeah. Pardon me? Are you back from Maine? We are back, yes. And I had a jungle. I came back to a jungle when no one had looked at it for four months, so. But I'm, know, having, I'm finding wonderful things growing. It's really oh, great. good. Yeah. You were talking about your mugwort, and I've done um, 
this year I took my mugwort on. It was this last year it was as tall as I am. Yeah. Um, so this okay. year I started weed whacking it early mm -hmm. and I've kept at it. And this fall, I swear I'm gonna dig it out because weed whacking worked, it did. So I guess my, my question is with mugwort is can you, should you cut it and not disturb the soil? That's, that's my concern. You know, if because I could- it's easy, The little ones you can pull out. Yeah, if I could, I would smother the whole place because that's, I think that's the most effective way to get rid of invasives. Unfortunately, I can't because of other stuff in the bed right. coming up too. I so found I'm a gonna, thing that's supposed to work. As what's that? It's called burnweed and it's a native annual. And I, I, I will come up with a, with a Nate, with the actual name of it, but it's, oh, it's yeah, called it's burnweed and it had this little fluffy flower. And they say that it, it will, um, it will suppress mugwort. Mugwort? That's what they say. Really? I can't remember who said that. But. Okay, we have to know about this plant. I'm going to look it up right it's, now. But burnweed must have a gazillion names. And Erythites hieracifolia. Yeah. 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 I, and yeah. that thing can get ginormous too. I actually had no idea how big it could get, but it was like almost like a pokeweed. Like it was big. Oh, so you know oh, you this mean one? It's that fat, that wide? Yeah. Now yeah. I cut it off at the base and because mine was only animal. one mine was only one stem that so was this one I want to say maybe it had gotten like a nick in it or something that that made it put out another branch and then it just went crazy. It's the only time I've ever seen a burn we do that. The rest of them have always been that single just chunky stem um, that gets that the fluffy, fluffy white stuff. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah, they're not and, pretty. Well, I thought yeah. it was a bad guy until I realized, you know, there's if it, it has so many seeds going for it, it must be an annual, it must be a native. And I looked it up and it was. Yeah. It so. says two to eight feet high. So you're right. Yeah. <laughs> it can get so do you want do you want artemisia or do you want burn wheat? <laughs> yeah. What is the native question? for sure? Yeah. I do uh, want to get rid of the mugwort. I'm not sure you can bury mugwort. I've um, I, I've gotten rid of most of mine, but um, we tried, um, you know, cardboard. I tried um, tarps. I, it, gr it, it, it grows through tarps. It grows. <laughs> I can show you what you're going to have a tour here. I can show you the tarp. Um, anyway, uh, so we just pulled it out every minute. You just have to be diligent, right? Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. controlled it in other places. I have, um, I've planted a, a low grouse sumac and a bunch of other stuff and it still pops up occasionally, but I just keep after it. Yeah, I think you have. Oh, has anybody had any problem with a uh, uh, common milkweed? Ours, I've, we've had some for years and years and this year it had this nasty little aphid critter that went through all of it. And it's oh, the black aphids. and yucky. Have you, have, has anyone had that problem? Yeah, they're I've orange, had right? It before. It's they, not really they're a orange. Problem. It was it's, it's not a problem, really. Um, it isn't. That's um oleander aphid. That's it. Oleander. It's the yeah. aphid, and it's part of a whole ecosystem, and it's a really high calorie food for many beneficial insects. The problem is, is that we don't have the beneficial insects to eat it. So right. it does the milkweed and the sap comes in and it's moldy and the plant can't be used by caterpillars. Um, there are, are, are Bico Organics sells lacewings and the lacewings are wonderful at eating the oleander aphids. Um, the larvae do, the adult lacewings are pollinators. So you have to have a lot of pollinator plants to establish a colony of lacewings. And once you do, then it goes back into balance. I have a demonstration stand of milkweed that was covered with the aphids turning black. And um, within probably three, four weeks, um, not a single aphid on there. Wow. And they survived the summer. So it's just out of balance what you're seeing. Well, it was funny though, because we've never, ha I've had these milkweed for 20 years and I've never experienced that problem before. And all of a sudden it's there. Maybe it's the heat or drought. Didn't we have a drought while I was gone? We did. Aphids are very common. It's a very common, so it just hadn't found you yet. 
I think. I don't well, think the oleander aphid is actually a native. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to look at, I don't think it is. Um, I, I thought it was not. The oleander aphid, I'm trying to see where it's native to. Um, I, well, oleanders are Southern, I think, Southern US. Native to the Mediterranean region, but it's oh, yeah. an native cast species throughout much of the world. Right. So I agree that it is found in our native milkweed um, stands for sure, but it is, unfortunately, it's a pest on those plants. Um, a lot of people will recommend um, just like hand squishing them if you, you know, get there. I also agree that they make good food for our lace wings and they, they actually help attract our native uh, predator insects. Um, and in moderation, they're not doing a terrible amount of damage, but if you don't have those predators to come and take care of them, they can be more of a pest, but they aren't necessarily part of the actual ecosystem. Uh, ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I made this, the only reason I was thinking that was because I thought, oh my God, look, this is a great thing that's happening. Look, there's this bug, this other bug's coming in. And then when I read, I was actually, I think on uh, one of the Facebook discussion groups about native plants and somebody had said, but that's, it's not actually a native <laughs> bug. And I was like, oh, really? So then I looked it up and yeah. Yeah. But, but I haven't seen any spotted lantern fly lately. Oh. No? Yeah, it's getting a little chilly for them. I didn't see as many this year as I have in the past, for sure. That's good. Yeah, and I keep seeing more and more pictures of people taking more and more pictures people are taking of birds that are eating them. So I think some birds are figuring out they might be, you know, not so bad. Great. That's wonderful. Good news. There's always, yeah. I guess we just got to see what's going to happen, right? Right. At the bad part about that is it's also um, praying mantis season. So everybody wants to praise all of these great praying mantises. And then you're like, oh, but you know, that's actually an invasive pest. And they're like, oh, no, save the mantises. And so you have to have that discussion all the time. And it always comes up, oh, but they're eating spotted lantern flies. Ah. They're so, eating hummingbirds too. Yeah, exactly. And, and they're not eating that many spotted lantern flies. So <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of one invasive pest to try and take care of another one. Right. Oh, well, it's good to learn about all this stuff though. Right, for sure. Um, okay, guys, I'm going to pack it in. Me too. <laughs> good night, Thank everybody. You for it was, it was, it was great seeing you all. Thank <laughs> you. Bye. 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 We'll talk again soon. Good night, guys. Good night, Audrey. Thanks for your help. Oh, yeah, no worries. Thank you, Ben and Ben, so, so much. It was so Bye, cool. Bye, double Bens. <laughs>